I'd like to thank Catherine Middleton from the NDD, the, the National Director of Divisions, for setting this up. Catherine is fantastic. I'd like to thank VIF for having us here in this wonderful day. I'd like to thank all of you for, for uh, on, uh, which is uh, Car Free Saturday, is that what today is? Yes. To come here and, and come to this very special, very important event that we're having. It's my distinct honor to introduce a man that uh, has a movie playing next Tuesday at 8.30. Uh, Vancouver, no fixed address. Apparently, it's played here 74 times. So, no. no, it's played 16 times, which is basically 74 times. That's how uh, popular it is. Uh, Kevin, no relation to Clint Eastwood and our esteemed panels. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, it's my great uh, honor and pleasure to be hosting this, uh, this session today. Um, I think you probably already know our guests, but I'll give them a little quick introduction anyways. On my right is Eric Overmeyer. Eric um, started in theater before moving into television with the modern classic St. Elsewhere. Graduated on from being just a writer to being a writer-producer with um, Homicide Life on the Street with David Simon, and then worked on Law and & Order, and uh, reunited with David Simon on The Wire, and then went on to co-create Treme, uh, with Mr. Simon, and then uh, more recently uh, created and ran uh, Bosch, and now most recently is about to uh, assume the role of uh, showrunner on the third season of Man in the High Castle, which he's uh, starting prep on tomorrow, and will go to camera in another week. Yikes. And then on my left <laughs> is, um, <laughs> yes. And then on uh, my left is uh, Vancouver's own Chris Haddock. Uh, Chris, of course, has been uh, a, a writer of a whole bunch of amazing Vancouver shows, but going back, he started out as a writer on such shows as Airwolf, MacGyver, even Danger Bay, before he moved up to being a showrunner on Thanks, uh, on on, <laughs> on Mom PI, and then the uh, the landmark Canadian TV series Da Vinci's Inquest, which obviously dealt with subject matter like missing and mur murdered Indigenous women, safe injection, long before anybody else was talking about them. And then he moved on to uh, they that ran for eight seasons. And there's the spin-off series, Da Vinci City Hall. And then he did Intelligence, and then had a CBS series called The Handler, and most recently just had the Romeo section, which we just wrapped up. Uh, the second season aired last, uh, last fall. <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll dive into the discussion. Um, obviously, this, a lot of people refer to this as the, kind of the golden age of, of television, or the, the third golden age. Um, the third one? Well, the third, I'm, I'm Alan Seppelwall, the, the, the critic, has talked about how it's actually the third round, because I guess there was the 60s, the early 80s, and now where we're at. Uh, certainly, this is the one that's the most um, kind of talked about in terms of uh, uh, cultural influence. I know the late, great David Carr talked about no longer is there any shame about talking about television. Nobody who's culturally literate would ever refer to it as the idiot box. In fact, it's almost the opposite. If you're not up on all these great television shows, many of which you've been behind, uh, you're considered ignorant and out of the loop. So I guess my first question is, what made you want to be in TV? Why do you, um, and that's for both of you, but we'll start with you, Eric. What do you like about the medium of television? Well, I, I, I never planned to be in TV. I, uh, I was a playwright. I, I hope I still am. And, um, and I just sort of fell into it, and I needed to do it because I needed to make a living. I was starving to death in New York. So, but um, the, they're congenial art forms, and I was able to. I, I was lucky. I had people who would allow me the time to learn how to do it, and I've I've been on some good shows and some terrible shows, like everyone else. But um, uh, now it's what I do. Uh, you, uh, men you mentioned theater. Do you see there being? A correlation between the two mediums? There are a lot of playwrights working in television, and there's some obvious things. Uh, character dialogue, um, uh, having a sense of how actors work. Um, playwrights can be good, can learn to write television, um, if they're willing to uh, cut it short a little bit. Now, Chris, what about you? You obviously have write it primarily for television. You don't write movie screenplays. You're, you, what is the difference for television for you? Why haven't you gravitated to, say, cinema? Uh, yeah, because nobody's bought any of my screenplays. The, um, <laughs> or they, they haven't you know, been made. Uh, 
but television a little bit a little bit similar similar to Eric in that I fell into it. It wasn't a goal. It wasn't. I was. Uh, I I had been doing. I was a musician, um, and uh, kind of fell into it. Uh, but ha had uh, been helping out a playwright it, it, um, with some lyrics and. Um, Somebody suggested that the, the lyrics, a character in the lyrics, would make a good screenplay, and so I wrote a screenplay and had some luck optioning that right away, and then um, you know nothing for a couple of years, and um, but then just somebody who had known me as a writer called me and said, "Hey, do you want to come in and uh, pitch something?" And it was just that kind of a, a boy. If I'm going to get paid, this is better than the 200 bucks a week as a musician, and. Um, so that was really what it was, and then I just found when I started working that because I'd had, you know, many different jobs, I was like, this all happened in my early 30s, so I'd had many jobs um, working in, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, dozens of sort of, that I had the ability to talk to people in, it, it, that I wasn't seeing on shows the ability for producers to talk to directors and, and many people afraid of communicating with actors and stuff and I had because I'd done some street theater and had done some you know and had been in bands and had been used to a collaborative and enjoyed a collaborative process that I was it just seemed a, a really good fit and then I just kind of because I was offered Canadian work um, and I was, I suddenly, I was working, you know, working on all kinds of different sort of shows, cop procedurals and stuff, Sonny Grosso shows out in, in Toronto as a staff writer. And then somebody tossed me the opportunity to, to write a, uh, an hour family drama, which was something called Mom P.I. And suddenly I was a, suddenly I was a showrunner. I didn't realize I was the showrunner until they invented the term showrunner. But, um, and then, I, and this, I was just thrown in the deep end. How, can you um, just, uh Describe what happened there in terms of what the how did you assume that role? What was the the situation? I had created the show and um, and uh, but I was throw, I, I didn't have that experience and I really had not been too aware of um, Had not been on stage much, you know on the on the actual floor on the set of all these other jobs it was sort of stuck in the writer's office or writers room. didn't really have the on set experience um, so, but I was just it was a, a weird little time in in Canadian thing. Atlantis was uh, was the um, production company, and they were too busy to you know hover over me too closely. And uh, they um, had a good, very good um, local line producer, Jonathan Goodwill, who was sort of steered you know me through the through the rapids it was just that I was a writer and I had ideas and I was able to in you know influence how my say in casting and and who they were tried to assign a producer that was um, that thought because I was inexperienced that I needed a lot of help and I had them fired so that was my first taste of <coughs> I have the power to fire somebody that's pretty good so I'll, I'll just pursue because you know you want the authority you don't you don't want to be making you want to make your own mistakes Particularly when you're starting out, you want to don't want to make somebody else's mistakes and have to defend them. And so that's what comes from original writing and, and the creation of a, of a of a of a series. Was that a surprise to you that you actually had that authority in that situation, or did you um, did you know it was going to work out? I had no idea. I, you know, you had to, you had to sort of learn who to get, you know because you're paying attention to. Uh, so many different things you have paying attention to the suddenly you're responsible for responding to budgets and and that's uh, you know learning what well we don't really need to you know how arbitrary some of the decisions are that we make and argue that they were you know made in stone fast in stone for a million reasons but a lot of stuff in television because you're moving so quickly and it's available materials actors aren't available writers aren't available uh, directors are unavailable so you're using the, in some ways, the materials at hand, and you've got to be able to. Oh, okay, we couldn't get that, so we got this, and, and you have to just be responsive to um, everything that happens in in the making of, in, under such you know production schedules. Is and you look for people that you can um, that are that are true, truly willing to collaborate and and not and and try and establishing trust on. Just trust that you you can be trusted in you know artistically or aesthetically or you know is a really important thing and it's a really important thing to uh, establish that with uh, whoever you're working with in whatever department. 
Eric, how about you? Can you just tell us a little bit about the first time you transitioned into actually producing a script that you had written on, on Homicide, Life on the Street? Um, Tom, uh, Tom Fontana was my first boss on St. Elsewhere, which was, uh, I think, the second golden age of television. So I'm, I'm, that, I'm not quite old enough to have done all three, but just about. Um, and then um, I was lucky enough to work with Tom again on Homicide, and he he was a, he's a rare um, sh showrunner, executive producer, and that he really wanted his writer-producers to produce. I, I know tons of people who have been writer-producers for eight, ever who've never produced an episode. They've never been allowed to. So I, it, it was my good fortune that, that he... he if you wrote an episode and you worked for Tom, then then you produced it, which meant you, uh, besides doing all the script work, you uh, did the casting of the day players and um, uh, you did set coverage and then you went into post. And so you, you did all the prep, you did all the shooting and and you, and you oversaw the post production as well. So that first happened to me on Homicide and I learned an enormous amount and it was hands-on experience. And, that's how you learn, right? What, um, for you, was there a, a curve, a learning curve, to understand kind of some of the other physical production-related facets of the job? Yeah, sh yeah, sh sure. The, the, the limits of, well, you're a, you're a line producer, you know, right? Uh, writers can come up with things that are not quite practical. Yeah. So, yeah, of course, you, you know, uh, you, you learn what the, what, what the show can, can do and can't do, and every show is different in terms of of their how agile they are, how much they can accomplish in a day, how many pages, uh, how many moves, all that sort of thing. And and uh, you learn how to. I learned a lot about working with the actors, the regular cast members, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it was it was it was a real education. And and uh, and one thing that. Uh, that I learned that that I had a facility for and, and took great pleasure in was being involved with the editors and realizing that that's the last rewrite that the writer gets, the writer-producer gets, and you can do a fantastic amount in post. The, the, the old phrase, save it in post, is not always accurate, but sometimes is. Now, I know you two are different in the sense that um, you don't actually spend a lot of time on set. You don't... Um Necessarily like being well, I, I I put in my decades on set, so I, I I don't really find it interesting anymore. I'd rather be back either in the editing room or in or, or writing. And can you talk about kind of what that um, you know on, on like what you're going to be doing coming up for Man in the High Castle? How are you balancing the time in the writers' room with um, the physical production kind of concerns? You know, uh, it's nice that they ask me my opinion about the physical production, but I don't really know anything about it in, in this instance. The show's been on for two years, and it has an amazing production design, if, if any of you have seen it. It's really, really brilliant. Uh, so uh, everything's fine, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it, you know, it's, it, the, coming into a show in the middle of, of its run is is a kind of an odd thing. It's the train is moving, and you just try to catch on and hang on. Um, so my job really is to get the scripts ready, and um, it, it's not it's not exactly the kind of showrunner uh, job that I've had in the past. Uh, but there are plenty of competent people handling all that, including the producing director Dan Percival. So um, they've got that all well in hand, and. I'll throw in my two cents, but it's really not not my province to to say yes. That's that's the dress she should be wearing. You know, um, I love that term, climbing aboard a moving train. Can you talk about some of the differences between having to do that versus getting to start from the ground up with Treme? Well, it, 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 it's just the difference between um, learning somebody else's language and and um, Catching up all the backstory and uh, uh, learning the language of the show and inventing it from the ground up on your own, and I, I think for me it's much harder to come in. I think I've done it two or three times. I've, I've come in in the middle of a run. It's very challenging to sort of you inherit a great deal, and 
uh, and that sounds like, oh, well, there's something to start with. But on the other hand, there's something to start with, if you know what I mean. The, the, ba the baggage that, that comes well, with. That's, yeah, that's the, that's the less polite term. Yeah. Right, yeah. Well, you know, but, it, but you've done, um, uh, on homicide, were you there on the original no, season? No, I, I came in quite late on homicide, really. Uh, You've, that was a remarkable show in terms of I remember the, in the in the first season uh, being really excited by what I was seeing because it was so it had such a a, f a feel of uh, reaching for to find its style and, and it, not not that that wasn't confident but the, I don't think a television at that time was hadn't seen that style of show in uh, in many years or ever yeah that it was 95 percent handheld and it was shot in 16 and all that stuff and they modulated the shaky cam the second season the first they sort of got a little bit of the shaky cam out of the way in the first well th there was a lot of complaining from the public about it <coughs> now i ask you a question about this and i don't mean to distract that style can be very familiar with it because in the stuff that i was able to do here really demanded our lower budgets and and difficulty of of you know, being able to purchase uh, time in studios or locations and et cetera, uh, you know, had to develop a sort of on-the-street handheld handheld style that also I felt, uh, and sort of having gone back and forth, um, that's, a, that, that's what I prefer to do is to have, and it goes to your question about I spend more time on set than, and not, and not this, is, is the, is the extent of, of, of the, the, uh, the extent, the reach of writing and the reach of a script and the function, some people believe that it's really, it, it's really, it's there on the page and the, and the blueprint, it goes off. I've never sort of embraced that idea because it's constantly changing and it's, no, it's not over until it's aired, you know, in terms of the ability to keep it sort of flexible and that has, for better or worse, become sort of my style is, the, is sort of working on set and allowing for um, it's, it's sort of it, it, in, the inclusion of good ideas uh, right on, right on the set, and I found I was more effective there than than um, I think as a showrunner you have to make your choice of how to use your time, uh, otherwise you're you're walking wounded pretty much right off the get go. Yeah, that's that, that's right. And um, uh, if the scripts need to be finished, that 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 takes priority, of course, always, so that everybody else can do their work. If we can just go back for a second, Chris. Now, you do spend time on set. In fact, you also direct, you often direct, I think you directed eight episodes of Da Vinci's, and I know you directed three episodes of the Romeo section. What is, um, why do you do that? What's uh, important about that for you? Well, it's a, it's a mix. I was sort of, you, you know, part of it was in, in Da Vinci was, uh, I, I said I needed to, I needed to go through the rigor of, Directing an episode to f to better understand all the challenges, the real challenges that um, that that requires, and uh, then it became a a way of articulating what the direction that I thought the show needed to go in, and I wanted to sort of be able to prove it myself that because it's very it's very hard to um, even as a writer it, it's very hard to bring other writers and other minds into your stream of style thinking approach and and you do that generally over time of working with somebody a partnership and you get you create the that that they say yeah we're all in the same direction that's all that, that this is our, what, what we've collaborated um so communicating to directors often or everybody else on you know everybody on, on think what you are trying to reach i found that i could demonstrate demonstrate that and take authority of it and um, also take ownership of the of, of, of the episodes or episodes where a tone would shift so that it was my responsibility to do that and I would take the responsibility of anything that was grievous with the network or didn't work it's like it was a, I didn't want to lay that off on somebody else who was be working at, at, at a disadvantage I wanted to do it myself and then it just I came to enjoy it but um, I've never been able to get really just high, just do an episode or, or, or is it direct? I, it's always been in the process of show running, and it's not never fun. It's 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 so exhausting, and I hesitate to do it. So I only do it now when there's um, the availability is a problem, or somebody falls out, or somebody quits. Now, uh, same question I asked 
Eric, you've stepped aboard a moving train as well. You um, joined the third season of Boardwalk Empire. What's it like to join a show like that versus your own work uh, that you're... you're well, very, di- you know, a remarkably different. I wasn't going in as a showrunner, and I wasn't going in. I was basically, I was called a writer-producer, but I was basically um, in, the, in, the, in the writer's room and, and, and captive in that room. Um, very different, and... Um, in some ways, it was you know relief because you're 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 going hey, I'm sitting in a writer's room and I'm just writing and I'm not responsible for all these other things that never leave you alone. There's no time, but you know, I don't know about Eric, but there's a very few hours when you're not thinking about resolving an issue of in writing or trying to you know resolve somebody else's issues, and that's brain tiring. But um, so I didn't have that responsibility. But you are saddled with some of the things that was you don't really know everything that's been discussed in the room before over the previous seasons and why things were rejected and why it wasn't going like this. So you're, you're, you're trying to carry other people's baggage, but you're there really not to... to ho- the, the reason that I was brought on board there, and I think it's the reason that they brought on many people over seasons there, was to tr- tr- try to try to open up the process a little bit and 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 not be very last minute closed and you know to, just to alleviate the pressures it was like really fresh fresh meat for either of you do you, do you learn things coming aboard a show that you weren't the showrunner on that's uh, affected how you operate when you are the showrunner pre i mean you joined boardwalk empire in the fourth season Yes, I did. He took he, <laughs> he took my cold chair. Um, you know, it it's just a leap of faith on everybody's part. You either it's either a good fit for you, and you you pick up. It it was easy for me to do homicide. I took to it, and I loved it. Uh, it was difficult on Boardwalk to contribute, uh, coming in from the outside because uh, uh, it, everything was sort of set. Um, and you would wonder why you were there. Um, so it, it, coming in on somebody else's show in the middle of a run is uh, sort of a, it's just a crapshoot, you know, and there are always jobs you, you take that you think, I, I don't know if I should take this job, and you then you usually, yes, you were right, you shouldn't have taken that job. Um, the first, maybe. The first, yeah. maybe. Um, obviously, now we watch television very differently than when we watch St. Elsewhere. We have streaming services. People binge-watch shows now. Is the, the common experience of, of a show. Um, you've, you've worked for conventional broadcasters. You've worked for a premium cable-style service like HBO, where there's not commercial breaks. And now you're, you're working for the second time with Amazon, who are a streaming service. So people consume television very differently. Does that change how you write? In, in, only in a couple of ways. I mean, it, it's it's still basically the same thing, and you still make the the show basically the same way. Uh, w- one big difference we were we were chatting about it at lunch. It, uh, on HBO or Amazon, there are no act breaks. There are no commercials. Uh, th- so that, of course, that's true of uh, Showtime and other other pay pay cable. Even on FX and AMC, there are, there are commercial breaks. And the, those act breaks uh, change the way you do scripts. Um, there's pressure to, to, to have five or six little mini climaxes throughout the, throughout the episode. And I've been lucky. I, it's been, I don't know, 10 years maybe since I've worked on a show where I had to do that. Um, I've been working for HBO and then Amazon. And, and you just write the hour. And you, so, so the structure is much more organic. It's not sort of artificially, oh, I have to have a little crisis here. We're eight minutes in, and we've got to go to commercial. Um, the, other th- the other thing, I think, that it's a tiny thing uh, with the streaming stuff is that um, you're assuming that people are consuming the product in a, in a bingey way uh, so that they're keeping track of it. They're not waiting week after week to see it. They're... They're watching three or four or five episodes at a time. In network, you have to recapitulate from week to week a little bit, and that's tiresome. Uh, You have to remind the audience where the plot is and who did what when last we saw them. 
So that's, that's also a positive thing, that you don't have to worry about that. You just keep going straight ahead. You can assume that when a character shows up again, they'll remember. Th yes, because it will only have been a few hours before <laughs> the last time they saw them, or the day before, and not a week or two weeks. What about you, Chris? Uh, you know, three of your shows have been, well, four, in including the spinoff, have been for the CBC, which still does have commercial breaks. Do you find, has your writing changed despite this kind of way that people are watching shows? Or, like, are you writing around commercial breaks? Or do you kind of ignore that and just write the Romeo section um, in the way that you would want? Uh, well, it, was st it started really, um, it probably in the third season of Da Vinci where I, where I said I, got, I, I hate the way that this is. Because th back then in 98, it was also this, the network wanted a credit sequence that was traditionally the same credit sequence and I, and I said I'm you know I'm always short of story time if I can get rid of that credit sequence I got about 40 seconds more story you know th and in the editing room that becomes you know you want 40 seconds so definitely you can use it and um, so I got ri rid of the credit sequence we just started sort of you know with a cold cinematic open over cr different credits over different different opening every the story the real story opening you get right to the atmosphere and you don't do the do the credit and that and that and then it was um, I never never wrote to commercial breaks I that was the the act breaks be, for commercials became the really an editing room decision and that that forced you know but I was working also on that style I said this was related to this one thing that the one thing that I discovered early on on Da Vinci was that there was so so at that time so many habits that had that had gone down in because of this need to build for you know climaxes for the commercials there were so many habits that were that were throughout the crew and and it, where where it was expected, uh, you know, it's the classic thing is you know the the actor leaving the room who just turns to say one more thing and the camera pushes in and we go you, know, you go you go to cut to the next scene or you cut to the next scene. So I would I I, I said listen we're not doing that we, we are not predicting because uh, that's a predictive move. Everybody in the audience already knows at this time that you're gonna, it's gonna be a slow push and the guy's gonna turn at the door. It's felt and it's known and I was trying to very much break out of, out of that because it was affecting not just the actor's turn and approach to a scene, but, the, to, but, but also the dolly grip. He, they're, all looking, they're all looking for it now. We, you know, it, it, all that was sort of following into this patterned stuff. So you could almost predict at the beginning of a scene, depending on some of the, you know what some of these things were shooting, how it was going to cut. Uh, you know, and this is part of storytelling that just works on you visually. So I tried to break all those habits um, rigorously, so that, that you know scenes would um, not end abruptly, but would not end where you would think a, a, a scene would. Would, would end, and at the same time, you know, the classic sort of story that everybody, or rule people repeat is come into the scene at the latest possible moment, leave at the earliest opportunity. And, and I tried to sort of argue with that approach to narrative as well, because I've, I've found that trying to, when, when trying to create atmosphere and a, uh, you know, a, a, a verisimilitude that, of authenticity, Authenticity somehow to a to a to a place and a mood stuff like this, is and conversations and how people broach subjects and stuff, is that I always appreciated the time in in a scene where it's the you know hey how you hi hello how are you to kind of uh, 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 approach to scenes and I said that's you know if you're cutting that out you're missing a lot of I thought the jockeying that people do in introductions. Uh, in, in when they have inter interactions with people, Wh uh, whether police coroners, whatever you're doing in a procedural, it's often straight to the you know, and, you're, and then you're just cutting out a lot of the, uh, a lot of that nuancey kind of thing that I love that, that because that's an opportunity when you're not really uh, throwing a lot of really, you know, plot or story laden information out there, but you are sending an enormous. Uh, 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 amount of information about the relationships between people and comfort and and you know that sort of thing and it's not 
dialogue, it's sort of easy dialogue that's almost just peripheral, unimportant kind of, you know, moves. And what that allows, I think, is for the audience to engage and project in and not be having to listen for that moment to, um, to all the dialogue and be on the edge of the seat of important information. Shut up, don't, don't close the door on that line. You, it, and somehow, it's the same way as when you go to a sort of plain expression or sort of the tabula rasa approach where you allow or you, you stop the noise in a scene or stop the pace so that an audience can actually find room in it to project their own interpretations on it because that's how you engage people. I, th I, bl I believe you engage them by leaving, by, by, by the opportunity for them to find a space and a hole where they can, oh, that, you know, that's where I relate to it. It's unconscious, but... So, you know, style-wise, I was trying to break a bunch of rules, not just to break the rules, but to try to get my narrative intuition out. Because you, you can get stopped so many times just by, by, by convention and rules and the way that stories are told and procedurals and what they're supposed to do and all that kind of thing. So. I have two things I want to say to that. Um, First of all, I love that you're one of the only writers I know that um, can always have more time. But often you hear writers who are stressed about filling a full 48 minutes to fill their slot, whereas you were like, no, let's strip away the title sequence so I can have more story meat to deliver. I can actually have more, more of the juice. Well, you can close. imagine how that, you know, if you're saving 40 seconds, how that can be, how valuable that is to a director in, a, in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the editing process. That's frames, you know, that's, you're arguing for... A beat, you know. Let's 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 have the breath out there, and you're going. No, we got to clip that thing because we're going. You know, we have to get this information in, and you don't. And then often, what happens is, when you're long, when you long to time, you got to go in and you got to cut. The first thing to go is character, because people go that you know you got to get the plot point across so other people won't do it. So everything that's trimmed is atmospheric. The first thing is that we don't need that establishing shot, or we don't need that. Thing, or you know, let's just a quicker scene. They do that. They get to that quick. Can we cut that line? And you end up going cutting, often character because people judge that. Well, we can't we can't have it like a hugely character laden show with where the plots. You know, we drop cut those plot lines out. That's essential. So. So it's always at the expense of character over because they can't produce the story. I think yeah. Now you also mentioned something else in there about. Um, the, your aversion to having actors kind of telegraph something, you know, just even with, with an act break and having a false climax. But I also know that you are somebody that um, uh, thinks a lot about ensuring that actors don't foreshadow something later in the season because they happen to know where the story is going over the season. Can you talk about that? What is it that you, um, and how do you protect against that? Uh, well, s some of it's as simply as the scripts aren't ready so nobody can steal them to read them. But... Um, <laughs> There, you know, you're trying to keep it. You can be, you know, uh, actors can 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 sense that after a while to show that hey, you're that I'm the villain, and 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 they they actually, you know, I've seen this happen many times. Is I want to be the good villain, you know, I want to show people that he's, you know, he's a villain, but he thinks it's he thinks it's right, you know, and and you get this, and you go, okay, so what you're doing is you're taking your you you're putting a element the actor is concerned about about wanting their character liked and that can re lead lead to signifying things that are not not supposed to be there and they could be little little things but um, so in controlling sort of the edges of the portrait so, you know the da Vinci you know part of the things was I, I you know the actors had so much to learn in terms of generally you know it's often long passages of a dialogue stuff like this that that's hard enough I you know don't did I wanted to keep them sort of like everybody is you don't know what's going to happen the next half hour or the next you know unless you're in, in, in trapped in that situation just keeping it fresh really on the topic of casting and performance. Um, Eric, what's, um, how important is it for you to know who's saying the words that you're writing? Is, does knowing who the cast are, like is it different writing a show that hasn't been cast yet versus one that you already know who the human beings reading the words are? Yeah, you're stuck with the ones that you, uh, you inherit. I mean, that's, that's a, a matter of uh, listening and learning those voices rather than inventing them or, or helping to invent them. Um, uh, when David and I did 
sat down and did Treme, we had a couple of actors in mind, but just a couple. Uh, uh, we had Wendell Pierce and Clark Peters, both from The Wire in mind. So we knew them really well. But everybody else we went looking for. And that, that was really great. We, um, you know, we talked um, for another part, uh, David Morse came in and talked to us. And we thought, well, he's, he's not right for that. So we wrote a part for him. So that we, and then luckily enough, he was available to do it when we went back to him after, after inventing that part, hoping that he would be around. You know? But of course, it's enormously helpful to know whether you inherit them or you're, or you're uh, trying to persuade them to do the show. Um, it, yeah, it's absolutely crucial to know the voice. Does it help? Um, were you able to kind of uh, envision the story lines further out, if you can picture in your head Wendell Pierce saying those words? Does it enable you to write more? Um, well, we didn't really work that way. I mean, we didn't, on Treme, we didn't, it wasn't a plot-driven show, so, so we let it lead us, really. It evolved. It, it was um, quite a joy, really, to be, to be free of the tyranny of plot. Um, you know, it, the, char the characters were, went about their lives and things happened and, and other things happened and they interacted or they didn't interact. I, I, I think there were characters on that show that never had scenes with one another over three and a half years. They, they would meet at the rap party, uh, the actors. But, um, yeah, it, it wasn't that kind of show. We, we, weren't, we weren't writing way out ahead of it. We were let, kind of letting it tell us what, what was next. I mean, everything you just described is pretty unusual. Being freed from the tyranny of plot, as you say, is, um, I'd say, uh, a privilege that most television writers don't get to enjoy. Um, Once in a lifetime opportunity. So can you tell us how that actually transpired? Like, I know you you live part of the time in New Orleans. When did you and David Simon, who you knew from The Wire, decide to make the show? We started talking about doing a show in New Orleans when we were uh, working together on the homicide. That's where we got to know each other. And uh, David was a frequent visitor to New Orleans. And we, we just started, it, it came about because we lamented that no good show we thought had ever been done in New Orleans, that uh, nobody really knew the city. They, they would come in and do the same five shots of the streetcar, Bourbon Street, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and then, uh, so, but, and we didn't have an idea. We didn't want to do a crime show again, so. The, the one idea we had was, oh, mu musicians, musicians. Th that's a show. And that didn't lead anywhere because we didn't know what we were doing. And then after Katrina, th it became clear. David said, well, we have to do the show. It has to be about coming back after Katrina, the city coming back. So so that's how it happened. And, uh, and it was lightning in a bottle, as I said earlier. Um, because David had had such a great deserved success with The Wire, his stock at HBO was very high. So when we went in a f few months after the storm and we went into HBO and we said, we want to do a show about New Orleans culture and the city coming back. And, uh, and they, they essentially said, we have no idea what you're talking about. We, we, we were talking about Mardi Gras Indians and Second Lines and the sort of blank look. But be, uh, uh, Carolyn Strauss, who was the executive at the time, said, I, d I don't know what you're talking about, but because it's David, uh, uh, I'm going to greenlight this pilot script. And we, so we did the script, and then they greenlit the pilot, and then they greenlit the season. And, and they let us go for three and a half seasons, even though you know, it was a small audience and it, was a, it wasn't a cop or a doctor or a lawyer show. Yeah. Or a musician who happened to be a cop on the side. That, that oh, whole, we missed that. that. We yeah. missed that. God damn it. A perfect example where you had a lot of non-professional actors, a lot of real-life musicians, real-life personalities in the show. Yeah, that, then that provided texture, but we didn't have any non-actors in leading roles. Um, we d we didn't make the mistake mistake of say casting Emeril as the chef. You know, we cast Kim Dickens instead, which was a good choice. What about um, even in in the the season of The Wire that you did, the fourth season? There's a lot of young kids who are non-actors. We saw a lot of kids, and we got really fortunate with those four main kids. Uh, you know, some of the other kids are less successful, but all those kids had had some experience, those four, and they were great. But we saw hundreds of kids to get to those four. 
uh, and we were very fortunate that, that we had them. So it was, I, I know you had made a comment before about it's more uh, David's um, uh, pursuit of verisimilitude to sometimes cast non-actors. Yeah, and it pays off a lot. And, and, then, and then sometimes it's, you get a kind of wooden performance that you have to kind of cut around. But uh, Baltimore is certainly a real character in The Wire, and New Orleans is a real character in Tremaine. And part of that is the locals, the local people, um, who, ha who bring an authenticity that's, that you can't match with uh, professional actors. What was um, what's it like working with on shows like both of those, both Treme and The Wire, where people are going to be very um, fastidious about the specifics of the authenticity? I know in in Brett Martin's book, you talk about how David Simon would be uh, concerned about making sure there'd be two exits of a of a room in a stash house or something, and would be concerned if a location didn't afford that. Is are those considerations that you see as as important in the writing? Well, it depends on the show. I mean, for both of those shows, yeah, yes. Uh, for uh, another kind of show about stash houses and drug dealers, probably not. You know, I, I think in both instances, certainly in the case of Treme, we were our first audience was New Orleans, uh, and w we didn't want uh, we wanted New Orleanians to say yes, that's real, because they were very used to saying no, that's nonsense when they when they saw themselves depicted. Uh, on screen, so that so we paid attention. How about you, Chris? How important is having people act and talk like they do in real life um, when you're creating a world of fiction? I, I know a lot of people have pointed out sometimes that your shows, for instance, the Romeo section had had language that might not be common on a, a conventional broadcast network in terms of how many f bombs were out there. But I think that was um, correct me if I'm wrong. You thought that was accurate. If you're going to show gangsters and crime people, that's how they talk. Well, it's, it, it, I, I think the trick is creating dra dramatic, heightened, heightened language and uh, dynamic that appears to be uh, <laughs> correct. <laughs> we have to adapt it that isn't jarring. And so, but it's still, you're still dealing with poetry and you have to be, it, it's not annou announced. It's, I, I find, I find, I, you, you know, I often find, I find a character's voice often in rhythm and in the rhythm, however it evolves, you know, some, some, you know, the actor can do it. But I've had the experience of casting and seeing five, six, seven, eight actors and you're going, well, the first one, a couple, you're going, Okay, they're just not reading it right, and then you and then you, and then you go. Okay, it's got to be the line, because because nobody's hitting this with the, with it. And then more often than not, the last person comes in, hits it, and you go. Okay, no, that was finding the. They found the rhythm that was somewhere there that intuitively uh, uh, comes out of the comes out of you as a writer. And but in terms of. Um, in terms in terms of language, you know, it, 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 it to me it's it's really figuring out, um, you know, it's partly the evolution of the function of the character in the whole mix, and what sort of angle on what point of view on life they do, they provide to the overall, you know, milieu and the canvas, and making those distinct, so that there's not a lot of doubling up of character functions that happens because this language is a little bit close to this language and then there's sort of an o overlap. And, um, so the, the, to me, I, I can only say it's just my ear, at the, it, is that my ear leads so much of, uh, you know, you write something and I'll repeat it to myself, you know, by the, I repeat it over and mutter to myself. And try to deliver the line, but I don't do that. Like, oh, now I've got to read the dialogue to see how it sounds like. Like, it's it's just sort of how you hear it. And then you, somebody comes in and takes it, and you go, "Great, that sounds fresh." And it's uh, it's it's a it's a it's all artificially constructed. I like to be on set so that I can bump it one way or the other, to either aid the actor or say, "Don't lean on that." That seems to me to be a little bit. You're emphasizing that. And it's not the important thing. Let's bury that because it's sort of you're leaning on it too heavy, or you're hitting you're hitting a point that the you know that the that the you know the cinematographer is hitting hitting a, hitting the same thing. You're hitting the same point three times or something like 
you know, the, the actor makes a dramatic move on a dramatic line, on a dramatic camera move in a, in a beautiful hit of light, and you're going, that's really overdoing it. Let's just peel that off, because we don't know to, you know, hit a, hit a point several times through all the other tools you can, and besides just the dialogue and the... Ultimately, you have to remember that the actor and the dialogue are a piece of the writing as a whole, and that they, uh, all that's a piece of the, all the many tools that you, that are storytelling tools besides verbal. So. Now on the topic of casting, you've, um, you've often worked with the same actors across different shows. I know obviously um, Ian Tracy, Brian Markinson, Eugene Lipinski, even Andrew Airely, the star of Romeo Section, was in Intelligence, and you were just talking about Wendell Pierce and Clark Peters being in both The Wire and Treme. What comes with that? Why do you do that? And I'm sure there's actors, perhaps in the audience, who are wondering, how do I get into that club? <laughs> like, what, what is it that, why do certain showrunners like to use uh, the same cast members? I think it's the same, uh, very much for the same uh, reason that you, you uh, w might want to work with the same DOP or the same director or the same editor or the same composer, is that um, g go going into gr a green collaboration w with somebody when you haven't been in the trenches with w with them, whatever, whether designer, whatever, whatever fu function of theirs, is a big risk because um, it's such an important element that everybody's pushing in the same direction at a cer at a certain point. Um, you know, the going back to similar actors is because uh, I'll be honest about the. There is not a great preponderance of choice in Vancouver um, as compared to Los Angeles or New York or uh, perhaps even Toronto. And when you come into a very busy environment like Vancouver is the, at, at this point, um, many actors are... are uh, of course, employed, and it's very hard to work when you've got everybody. It's very hard to put a schedule together, and you want it's like this. So you're not necessarily getting an opportunity to meet some of the some of the actors you should be meeting or or, or, or casting. So you know, I go, okay, there's somebody who's really, you know, could work out. Not haven't worked with them. Not quite sure. Well, like this. And their availabilities, they're, they're booked on three shows. We're going to have to move things around for them to get to them to work at the time. I'm going, yeah, that's not the ideal situation um, for either end of that equation, either the actor who's coming in and, you know, and having to learn something really quickly and not be around the, the set and the movement like that. So you end up um, working with actors, at least I end up working with actors that I know have range and can take on another character and not be... But that's generally the you know generally we have a bit of the difficulty of that in 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 Canada and what I've sort of at least hope that I've maintained is breaking in a lot of actors and there's not a lot of you know middle-aged actors that come new into your per, you know in, into your view that, that that suddenly have come into the industry and they say like, oh hey there's a whole new range of you know you know some of these people and you you know what's in that range the younger actors is where you get make discoveries of. And, but you don't always have the roles for you know younger actors, so you have to, and then reach out. And I reached out very deliberately in in the uh, Romeo section to um, write a lot of Asian characters and Asian roles without knowing and having any you know real proof that the actors when I went looking for them would be there. And uh, at a certain point, I, and that was that was expressed by somebody else. So you know, that, so I just said, "Fuck it," you know. I know that you know we, we've got a very large community here, and um, I'm going to go for it. So we did a really, with the casting director, we went out and we saw uh, you know, a lot of, lot of people, and a lot of people who had done nothing, or done very little. And um, so I came, okay, roll the dice, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll see how it works out, and if it doesn't work out, then I, I, can, I can adjust, or you know, I can maybe diminish the size of a role if it's not. But you have to, so I'm, I'm very comfortable doing that. And have done that often in the past, and working in a Da Vinci, a, a lot of non-actors um, hired a lot of non-actors. But it, but it, you know, it's the limitations of the role. You don't necessarily want to roll the dice on that on a lead role that's you know that's going to hey, this is a continuing character, and I don't really have seen enough evidence. So in on Da Vinci and you know and everything I've done, I've brought a lot of people in in and sort of tested them in in background roles but speaking to see how can they handle this. And then maybe in the next year, I'd promote them to a, 
uh, uh, you know, a, a much larger role and not the same character. And some, some people started small and carried on and carried on and got their chops together and started to feel comfortable on set. And part of the thing is you see as actors come, you know, it's the same with the directors, is, uh, is uh, or anybody coming new to a show, you know, is that you, um, is, is, is that you want to feel, uh, it's very important that they all feel comfortable and, and, and not, on, not on their toes all the time and, you know, being careful about, you know, your eyes out for who, who's got a who's got a touchy temper and is going to yell at you for not being in the trailer when they're looking for you and all whatever you've got to feel, hopefully make a comfortable entrance for people. I mean, a great example of somebody who you give a, a chance to then rises up is obviously Faye Wren, who was you know, uh, a relatively small role in season one of Romeo Section as Wing Lay's wife, and then season two she's a big part of the whole storyline of the movie within a movie. Um, Eric, um, Chris was talking about how there's sometimes it's it's tricky in given the the this the depth of the the pool in Vancouver compared to somewhere like New York or L.A. You work in New York or L.A. How is it for you? Do you find that there are still sometimes challenges in finding? Well, this is one of the uh, unintended con consequences of the golden age of television. Uh, there are almost I don't know 450, 500 scripted shows now, according to somebody. Um, and so uh, the casting, our casting people who are brilliant, they're always complaining, are complaining that everybody's working, which is a good thing, right? Um, let's wait till pilot season's over. Maybe somebody we want will become available. Um, and the same, same goes for crews in New York and LA and, and, uh, and here in Vancouver, we shoot here. So, you know, there, there are challenges. It's, it's, it's a good time to be in television. Uh, but it's it, sometimes the actors and the writers and directors you want, and and the DPs and the costume designers are not available. Now we were also talking about um, going with talent that you know, and the risks of green working with somebody who might be more green. Um, how important is it to you to work with writers that you know in the writers' room? Um, well, if if I can, I, I like to work with people I I've worked with before. Um, it's not always possible. When I was hired on this last November on Man in the High Castle, um, there was nobody on the staff. Only one writer was coming back. I didn't know him, but I hired him uh, after talking to him. And then I had, uh, interviewed a lot of people and hired a staff, but I'd never worked with anybody on, uh, before. Everybody that I knew or had worked with in years past was working. It was an odd time of year, you know, uh, so. Uh, so you just you know you you go on intuition and you you ask around you know and uh, people who've worked you know you do your due diligence just to make sure you're not hiring somebody who's got a reputation for being impossible. You know, one of the one of the one one of the things that is is what is just generally why you want to work with people that you've worked with satisfactorily before, is the second time around you dig the groove a little deeper and you don't need to go back to first principles with everybody and start back like like yeah so, that's right that's you know so you yeah and you're moving you're like you can say hey we're 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 it's like a band you know if you've been on the road for uh, a, a considerable amount of time, um, you know the groove gets tighter and less needs to be said and more room is for flavor to come forward. On the same uh, kind of idea of the, the groove being deeper, um, I know, uh, you know, Romeo Section only had 20 episodes, but obviously Da Vinci's had 90. What's it like making a show that's on its 90th episode um, compared to one that's still in its early couple years? How are you uh, writing something different then? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a, uh, to use that example. Okay, I'll, I'll use that example. At the at the not on the ninety, I think it was nine, 90, 90, yeah, maybe ninety. And then we did another fourteen for um, City Hall. It was uh, I felt when that show was, you know, canceled. They were going to cancel Da Vinci at at the end of the ninety, and. Um, but I made some arguments and said, "Look, it's not. You know, I still don't feel like I'd still like to be doing Da Vinci. It's still, it's. I, I still love the voice that 
in big, and was so involved in in Vancouver, so particular about it, and so in the street, and so had its thumb on 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 the pulse, and was actually had a very very uh, it had an impact on the, on on real life, and both no, not only in the fact that it got the you know Larry Campbell who was the consultant on the show and. I uh, used, you know, stole much of it, it's, or some aspects of his life story to tell. Is that he used the fame that he got on the show to become mayor, and affect and people confused the character of Da Vinci with Larry Campbell, and so got the you know elect. He was ex they was expecting sort of on that. So the show had had a impact that was. Um, Vital, and it was exciting to me to be to because so often you're involved with shows that have to be about nothing because status quo is really the aim of much media, and uh, so that was a that 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 was sort of a a big a big thing. But it well, I, I mean, I remember reading about how episode one of Da Vinci's Inquest is talking about the number of missing and murdered indigenous women in Vancouver. And that was before anybody else was talking about it. And that was when a McLean's writer saw that episode and was like, wait, what? And a McLean's writer based in Toronto was like, what is this they're talking about? All these women dying in Vancouver? And then she wrote a big investigative piece about it. And that's ultimately what started creating the national conversation that led to the investigation. And ultimately, Willie Pickton being behind bars. Well, I don't know whether, you know, I think that's a little... I might be drawing a very hyper, hyper, I, yeah. I would. I would not. I would but. not. Listen, there was a lot of people pushing, yeah. did, fighting very hard for that to become come to the come to the surface. And there was a lot of people burying that. It was a very deep. It's still ongoing. For God's yeah. sakes, they're still burying the story. It's it's being buried today. It's happening with this with this uh, f feeble. Corrupt commission. I don't want to go. Okay, I won't say corrupt commission, but but my point I is will that say you're talking that about kind of really relevant they're issues. They're still alive that. today, and that excites me. Yeah. I have a I have a, a little bit more difficult time writing stuff that isn't about anything that doesn't that doesn't somehow um, question the status quo because that's a vital part of of writing and. It's what a lot of people. I think with it, you know, it's just that's just I'm, that's sort of my thing. No, even on the Romeo section, it seemed that we we would be shooting episodes, and then like a month later, we'd see something in the news that was kind of reflecting that, whether it be um, issues of uh, kind of false flags or fear mongering around. Um, terrorist threats and entrapment by law general, enforcement, global you know, general security agencies. The general sort of manufacture of paranoia. And was that a conscious thing to be reflecting what we were hearing about in the news, or were these issues that were of interest? The, 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 well, both. But the, you know, gen generally, I've been interested for like where, where crime and government meet. That, to me, is a just sort of a, a great place for me to start. Because I care about where all those things, because they, 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 that's a huge, you know, um, crucible. And I'm, I'm very, because that's where things are buried and concocted, and it's the history of the world. And, um, but, you know, you just get, just sometimes, sometimes it's just that, you know, you feel that you've got a, 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 D d you know, it's the scene or the character lines. It become you. You become passionately involved involved with it, and 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 there's a and you're feeling hey, there's a connection here to to, to real life. It's not, it's, you know, the this whole the, there's a saying of hey, if you want to send a message, so to send send it West, Western Union. That's that sort of comes out of Hollywood, but that comes out of a bunch of guys who just wanted to, to maintain, you know, the, be at the top of the heap, and that was their sort of. You know, it's a safety point. You can stay on air if you're not political. So, now on the other side of the uh, the coin, how do you manage a show like *Man in the High Castle*, which obviously people are reading, given this current uh, American administration, um, with a lot of analogy and stuff? But how do you they navigate are? that when it's a purely fictional realm? Uh, I, I've banned the T word in the writers' room. 
because I don't want to draw easy, um, easy analogies or comparisons. I think the show has its own resonance, and people will. I, I want to do the show without being distracted by that guy. And um, I think if we do the show, there will naturally be uh, a certain amount of zeitgeist resonance, maybe a lot. But um, but I don't want it to be easy. I want it to be. I want. I, I need to be true to the show and the show's narrative. And uh, and people will draw the the inferences themselves. I don't do want to lead the audience by the nose. Do you think, though, it, even if it's kind of not um, letting the audience be led by the nose to anything, do you think you have a very different job coming in on season three when? the T word is in the White House versus the previous two seasons? No, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I'm, I don't, no, I don't think so. I think I would like to do the same show uh, that I would have done if the results had been uh, different. Um, I think that's true to the material. Uh, and it's about issues, you know, it's about how to be a human being and a, like all Philip K. Dick stuff, it's how to be a, a human. It's about how how, do, how, do, how are you? A, how is it to be a human being in this in this landscape? This whatever it is, whatever he's cooked up. Uh, how do how do you live? How do you survive it? What choices you make? So um, you know, I mean, I say that it, uh, probably it's inevitable that it will have some warping effect, but I'm trying to keep it to a minimum because. I, I don't want it to be. Um, I want. I, I want it to be true to itself, and not. I don't think I need to use it as a cudgel. Um, I, I think the. I think the resonance will be there, obviously, because of what's going on. I mean, it's, or another way to say it is, it's a good time, in terms of the zeitgeist for Man in the High Castle. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience in a moment. I just want to ask a couple of last questions. Um, we talked, you, you mentioned about working with a team and you mentioned the role of the cinematographer. Uh, I'm curious if, um, if you can just describe, obviously you had a very long-term relationship with, with the Da Vinci's DP, the great David Frizee, who then moved up to being a director on the show and was one of the main directors of the Romeo section. I think he, he directed almost half of the first season. And then obviously um, we've a, we had a phenomenal DP, Brendan Ugama, on the Romeo section. How uh, Can you just speak about what um, you look for in that relationship with that person who is contributing the visual style of the show? Well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm sort to of to talk about directors in 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 that as, as well as if, 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 if I can is um well again it's you know it's it's really the, it's really Dave Dave uh, Frizee the first episode of I hired him to, to you know direct in the first episode first season not director sorry be be, be the the DOP of the first um, of uh, Da Vinci and we just um, hit it off and Dave has a tremendous amount of um, Energy and uh, you know a, a can-do ism. There's nothing that he, he he'll take whatever challenge and and he's you know tireless and runs a very tight crew. And um, so when you talk when you when you when you, you talk to Dave, then the, the, the message gets you know sent out efficiently and nobody's guessing about or contradicting contradicting him. And he, and he became eventually he, he had directed a couple of things before, but then I started you know um, encouraging him to or offering him to you know to direct and just um, he contributed so much both in terms of bringing new. Tools like the simply like the jib arm that you know that came to that people were a bit wary of and and get, allowed us because we were fast and dirty to have a fast and dirty effective you know crane basically that's a half dolly half crane a, a, a very handy tool that so he's very invented that way um, and then um, you know worked with other DOPs when Dave was directing and you know find quite a different range of people. You just want people. My sort of key, I think, is is hire the best people that you can possibly find, and stay out of their way. You know, and not and not try to impose. I want you know, bring. I'll get out of your way. Just bring me what you, 
you know, and and allow and once that and have open communication all the time, open conversation, yelling across the set, whatever. There's no secret, you know, not a secretive, you know, uh, thing where people want to own the, you know, whispering owning, you know, hiding what it is from people. You got to sort of have an open room for most most of this stuff. And and directors, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it, I, I ended up working with. Both Dave, but a number of directors over, over and again, and of course, you know, this year, you know, had uh, directors became available. We worked with, you know, I think the last season, Michael Robeson came in and did was, um, and I'd never worked. I worked with Michael as a editor really early, and 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 he'd spent much time editing, and he brought it. You know, the, a, a similar thing to Dave is what these guys want to go into the editing room with a lot of uh, potential to tell a story, and they know how to efficiently. Um, you know, cover cover a scene without it being um, wrote, and um, do their their rigorous with their homework, and they come prepared. Now Dave comes to the set with um, he's got to be he's got to see the scene, see the set, and all this stuff. He's got his you know pocket full of uh, of of ideas, and um, and Michael's been such a veteran, you know, and worked in the editing room, so. Um, and then we worked with Ann Wheeler, and um, Ann's, Ann's, Ann's a veteran, has her own particular style. And really what it is when you get people who have uh, evolved to the point where they have their own style, I mean, they really do bring, bring, an, bring an approach. But you want a consistency in the show. You don't want one episode being, well, to broadly, you don't want one, one, one show being jiggle cam and, and the next being... Um, you know, uh, all, um, all, uh, all, well, you know, uh, or one or two masters stuff. So, you know, you, and, the, and you have to talk, I know, the, uh, you know, you have sort of basic, simple conversations um, w with the directors and say, this, you know, try to, if you have something to show them, and it's not brand new, you know, these are the elements of the, that we try to show. We don't, don't, don't take that too seriously because we're trying to work away from that. You try to have, and you're spending a lot of time with the director, at least I am, because I'm, um, you know, both in casting and um, in various meetings and some surveys and stuff, I spend to try to try to spend as much, even though I know them well. Uh, you know, I've, I've known them over the years. Just having you repeat, just like let's talk about what it's about and what's what what's not, to, what's in the, you know. And then I'm, uh, uh, you know, it's just the flexibility and, and and again trust. It's like I know that certain directors aren't going to be offended if I step in and say, Lee, you, you know, I'm going to talk to the actor right here, you know, because I want. I want to directly say to them, you, you're busy. You got, I know you got stuff to think. You're going to go set up the next thing, whatever. It's. And nobody takes offense of that. And I think that that's um, that's just a matter of you know extending respect to um, respect to as many as people that you can until they lose it. Um, for those of you who have never seen David Frizzi in action, it is quite a remarkable sight. Just in terms of his his energy and his gusto, I can remember times when I'd arrive on set. In the morning, and um, David would come up to me and go, Kevin, where is everybody? I'm like, it's, it's not a, even an hour to call yet. <laughs> like, or, you know, and usually by 15 minutes before call, he'd be like, okay, everybody, here's the shot. And if you weren't there already, um, you'd be missing out. Do I even remember production meetings where somebody would point out a challenge to a location, and he's like, okay, okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, hold on. And they're like, and, and he'd be point, leaning down with his forehead, and somebody would say, are you reading the scene? He's like, no, I'm, I'm just watching the scene. And I'm like, you mean reading, because I'd see the script. He's like, no, I'm watching it. And he would be watching it in his head, and then he'd figure out the solution. He's like, okay, this is what we're gonna do. Um, Eric, for you, you're, you talk about being so involved in the, the edit stage. For you, is that one of the, the primary kind of creative collaborations, or how close are you to a DP or production designer? I, I'm not. I, I let I let somebody else tell me that who, who the right person is to hire. Um, I'm close to the editors, and, and I enjoy that part of it the most. I think it's more enjoyable than the writing. It's a lot more enjoyable than the shooting. So um, it's just me and the editor going. Let's try this. Let's try that. Let's take that line out. That's terrible. For that reason, do you regularly try to work with the same editors you know? I do, yeah. And again, you, you get lucky if they're available. Uh, and one of the odd things about television these days and wh why the Writers Guild almost struck 
the schedules have changed. With 10 episodes, actors, uh, crew, editors, everybody, there are a lot of months to fill. You know, when you were on a network show, that, that, that took up 10 months of the, year, of the year. If you're working six months, what are you going to do the other six months? So it's often the case that by the time you're ready to crew up again, uh, the people you want to work with are, have had to take other jobs. Um, so uh, it's something that everybody's struggling with, uh, how, to, how to make this new uh, universe of golden age television economically possible for the people who make it. Okay, thank you. Um, so I think now is a perfect opportunity to uh, to throw it to you guys. Um, yeah, just by putting up your hand, and there are microphones, so if you can wait for a microphone to get to you. So I think the first hand up was the lady right there with the glasses. So if we can get a microphone to her, I think it's on its way. If you can just wait for it, excellent. Okay. This, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much. And um, Eric, I um, I'm came up through the theater, actor and uh, director, and so I grew, basically grew up on your plays. And <laughs> and I'm just wondering, are you uh, are you writing more? What's 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 that part of your life like now? I, I'm working on a, a piece, a, a sort of a sort of a musical with mm. a, a couple of really f fabulous songwriters. So I'm enjoying that a lot. So I'm, I'm trying, you know, sp spare time and all. Um, but but I, have, I haven't given it up. I'd love to do it some more. Uh, thank you. Great. I'm just curious, Chris, because obviously you've also been involved in theater, although kind of the opposite trajectory. You started out in theater, moved in television, started out kind of in TV and did Helen Lawrence just a couple of years ago, which is an amazing play that toured around the world. Do you have any plans to do any more theater shows? Um, no, no, no plans, ideas, wishes, possibilities, you know, schemes. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to your schemes. Um, next question, I think, was the gentleman in the green right at the back there, yeah. Uh, I got a couple of questions, but feel free to skip one in favor of time. Uh, one is, I'm curious uh, about the creation process of a TV show. If you could briefly speak to how do you go about creating a TV show, and also this being a DGC event, we're just wondering how can new DGC directors get involved with um, shows? In so general. for the first question, Eric, how do you go about creating, when you're not jumping aboard a moving train, how do you go about creating a show? Uh, Chris should probably uh, talk to this a little bit, but in the two cases where I've been involved in creating a show, I, I've been lucky enough to have been invited to do so. Yeah, in the first case, m through my friendship with David Simon uh, and our talking over the years about New Orleans. And in the second case, um, I was in the New Orleans airport the day after the wrap party for the third season, wondering what I was going to do next. And my cell phone rang, and it was Michael Connolly, who I had met once before, months, months ago, and saying, uh, we so we have an opportunity to do a, a pilot based on my books. Are you interested? So, I and we've said, barely so, talked about Bosch, but uh, any of uh, you that haven't seen it should yeah, watch it. So I said, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was I'd read all the books, and I also needed a job. So, so I'm not. I think I'm not the right person to really to ask. But then the process is, uh, you just sit down and start writing the pilot, and and that's arduous. But in both cases, um, I, Michael, I, I didn't Mike, really have to, to do the hard work of, uh, of just starting from scratch. Was, was, My, was Michael uh, uh, oh, oh, eager to let you take ownership of the adaptation? Co-ownership. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, Michael is great, and, but, but he is definitely um, a smart guy, and he's he insisted on being involved because it's his baby, you know, and it's been his baby for 25 years. So he was very open to updating and uh, altering story and that, that sort of thing. He was not open to anything that he felt would violate the essential core of the character. And that was valuable, you know. If we came up with some harebrained idea about Harry Bosch going on a bender, Michael would say, um, no. <laughs> Chris, how do you go about 
plucking something out of thin air, and are you doing that right now? Uh, Not like right now uh, on the yeah, stage. Um, you know, I don't think anything's really plucked out of thin air particularly, but um, I do. I do. Uh, you got the big the big question to to me is, am I? And in this and this takes some practical investigation sometimes, of of trying to write write out premises or or, or even scenes sometimes. Of can I live with this? Is it truly of of deep enough? Uh, interest to me that I can do this for the length of time that it may take to get this thing up and it stay on air? Is it, is it a deep enough, wide enough, rich enough vein that, and if it's, an, and you, I can quickly decide something, yeah, no, that's not good, that's, you, I don't want to be doing that for, you know. Uh, potentially you know, eight years. Well, it, even potentially ten, 10 episodes, you know, things you got, you know, things can run, run dry very quickly and they can be very good, but they, this is what the Brits do better. Is the Brits have always uh, not always, but they've they've had to change to be more of the American model lately. But is um, is that uh, they 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 really let the story and the material tell determine the length of its episode. They can be six episodes because that's what it's told. And you know, and we're we're seeing a lot more of that where where there's there's more I think now amongst cable is okay. Maybe it's you know two two seasons and out and it's done and people are satisfied and it's you know it's satis it's got subscriptions for the channel it's all wor it's all worked out I like that that has um, it started to happen and that opens up creative possibilities because when you've pi been pitching and creating shows often it's everybody simply is like I don't see this running you know more I don't see the material oh, they'll say yeah that'll run. Five, six, seven years. We can see that, and, and then you're you're going into okay. What what do you not? What do you have to do to be make a show that is uniquely the same every week? If you know what I mean. There's this there's expectation that you that you keep a show going for a long time, but which means that you, okay. So how are you going to restrict change amongst the characters so that it all it all kind of kind kind of works? But uh, just to starting up a show, it's just really. Um, Digging into something that, that and finding it, turning it over, trying a couple of things on it, thinking about who might be in it, thinking about. I try not to interrupt. I get I get quickly slammed by the um, by certain production elements, and that's a that's a problem I have. So I'll have a really good idea, and then I'll sort of you know lurch up and go, "Oh my fucking god, that's impossible to produce," uh, which is the problem of being a writer producer, is is you can kill your own imagination too early. It's like self-censorship that is, you know, not particularly evil self-censorship, but it's just can't do that, it's too expensive, can't do that, don't have the location, can't do that, don't want to leave the dogs alone at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, and sorry, I know you had two questions, but I think in the interest of time we're going to keep on rolling forward. If you want, we could probably answer it out in the lobby after. Uh, I think the gentleman with the beard right in the middle there. With the I'd like to thank all three of you for coming out tonight. Um, Chris, you mentioned that uh, as a showrunner, you had to figure out how to bring other writers into your stream and style of approach. I'm wondering if either of you have any advice uh, for maybe newcomers into a writer's room for the first time on how they can adapt into a showrunner's style of approach. Uh, listen. Uh, and um, the thing I find most maddening in the writer's room is uh, uh, the temptation to follow, uh, it's non sequitur, the temptation to follow any rabbit that runs past your field of vision down a different rabbit hole than the one you're talking about. It, 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 it's crucial sort of to, to f tease out an idea uh, and, and until it's exhausted or validated rather than, sit, th than uh, introduce another idea just because you're, you had a a brilliant thought that was suggested by the first one. If you know what I mean, it, it's a kind of protocol that's that it's hard to enforce, but it, but it's really crucial, I think, in the writers' room. Do you know what I'm talking about? I know exactly what you're talking about, and it's really uh, you know I can't tell you how many writers we maybe worked with a mutual mutual fellow who uh, 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 boxed boxed into a corner invents a new character. Because you don't have to deal with and this, this, you know, the attempt to constantly get out of problems by inventing a new ha a new rabbit. Well, the rabbit, the, the, yeah, and one reason I banned the Trump, the, I mean the T word, hmm. 
uh, was was that it was, it was too tempting for everybody to go, oh yeah, you know, and then did you see what Trump did? Uh, you know, uh, you know, and that was not what the topic on the table. So uh, s listen, I would say, for a new writer, listen and learn the the voice of the show. And I, I'm not saying don't talk, but um, uh, try to focus on, it's, it's, on it, the topic it, at hand. It, 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 uh, and it is, it is very much, I uh, totally agree. It, it's, it's, le it's learning, uh, listen, listening and learning and trying to, and trying to mimic it. And, and trying to find the rhythms in it because you can't just always just read some or you know your voice as you say it outside uh, inside your head it can be it's, there's no information but but if you write it you know if you take something like this and you and you get in you simply write a couple of pages that they've written and re and rewrite over them you you ought to you you have to you know really pursue it and then once you get it that's if you're attuned to nuance in in ear and um then there's structural things that are you know happen every every, every show and you want it like this they pay them like this and then, but it's also asking asking and trying to get trying to get out of the um, head writer uh, or the author of the uh, of the show to, to to get them to try to articulate some of the things that are that are not not just to say like I go go home and again bring something back that's not the most efficient way of of get of, of get of getting in there, and there's the, 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 a writer's room. If it's if it's well composed, brings different uh, uh, writers. Writers are, are bringing different things to it, and different talents to it. Same as you put a put a band together for a recording or, or, or something. You know, you choose, you know if you. But that's very difficult to do. What about for people who, in the audience who might be more emerging? I I knew this kid. He was a bit of skate punk. I knew him in high school. And he ended up being the great Jesse McEwen, who was your other main writer, yeah. and also co-ran 19.2 and was just writing a big FX show in New York. I remember when Jesse was just one of your story interns. Yes. How do you how do people get in, their foot in the door and be a Jesse McEwen? <laughs> other than being really talented, it's every it's unique. There's no there's really no there's no. There's no pattern. I mean, you, you know, the, you write number one. Write, have something to write. Don't just bullshit your way into the door, and because opportunities, you know, you only often get the one opportunity to uh, pitch yourself to, to to somebody, and the judgments are made for ill or not um, quickly on 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 your personality and your uh, all, all that kind of stuff. So you know you want to have a you know and, and a lot of people don't read you know they can say yeah let me a script I'll read it and they never read it and they never, you know it's, it's hard enough to get people to read anything even if you know I just read your script we just shot it three weeks ago you know uh, <laughs> the what whatever so everybody's there's so much demand on everybody all the creatives and every, all executives bureaucrats there's so much going on so many distractions that um, you know you have to prove at some point to somebody that you can. Really right, and even then, it's tough to just read a script and say, you know, how long did this take? Because if it took you ten years, that's not a fair judgment of whether you can write with speed and collaborate. And you don't know. Can you collaborate? Are you a good guy in the room? Or are you a, are you a you know a buzzkill in the room? It's it's many many of these things are really important, but it's also you don't know wh whether you can have an autocrat at, at the top of the thing. You know, it's just a very uh, you know, it's tough in Canada. It is not the circumstance. I just want to just uh, just say how different it is to be a Canadian in in the world of uh, television creative. Like just because so many of us are, the, um, there is no in our realm of possibility no career in Canada, and it's everybody's going. I got to I got to go elsewhere. Well, when you do that, you're leaving the place that you know behind, and you don't get the opportunity to write about things that. That, that you know and you, you don't have to do that. You have to do the extra labor if you're going to work with somebody else and write about it. Now that's not so different than, than having to write about in, in you can live here in Vancouver know well and you're writing a, you're successful writing about shows that take place in different alternative times or like that's I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, the, comp, the, the ability to go a little bit deeper at least I, for me. When I started to do a Da Vinci and I was able to write about a city that I know intimately, corners I know, uh, you know, places in the city I know, scenes I know, people, all that kind of thing, costumes, hairstyles, all that, all that stuff that you're very comfortable with, and you can measure your, 
your accurateness against against what you know from what you know what you're seeing, and that's really an important thing. We're headed into a bit of a t hard time here, as you would obviously. Uh, the Directors Guild knows itself just in terms of the future Canadian uh, product and how many times a show like uh, Da Vinci or some of the uh, you know truly Canadian shows are, that are about our lives here in Canada are going to be able to be made because of a lot of people under under an immediate pressure. Um, I think we we can do one more question before we get the hook pulled on us. So um, I think you had your hand up first, right there. If somebody can get a microphone to you. And while the microphone is just traveling to you, I'll just say thank you all today for coming. Um, uh, there's been, there's, I feel like we could keep going on. There's topics we I feel we haven't even touched on just now. You're talking about the differences between north and south of the border, but. Um, uh, hopefully you'll have an opportunity to maybe talk to us after. But yes, last question. Uh, thank you. Um, you were getting into it a bit there, uh, Mr. Haddock, about, uh, to, to my point about uh, when you're creating a show and you have an idea for a show, and you touched on it earlier, Eric, where you uh, mentioned uh, you have an idea for a couple actors that would be ideal for the piece. Um, do you find that it helps that you communicate with that actor um, before, like in the development process, or is this more like, oh, we want to work with this person, and you create the piece? Well, uh, in the case, in the example I was using, we had those actors in mind, and um, before, but since we didn't have a script, we we didn't we didn't talk to them, but we knew them, so we knew their voices. It helped write, helped us write, and uh, a couple seasons in, we decided we needed a. Uh, a Latino character, and we we just started shorthanding. We say, yeah, okay. So John Seda comes to town because we both worked with John, and he does this and he does that, and and we were developing. And finally, one day we looked at each other and said, you know, we should just call John Seda for this, and we did. And he said, yes, I'm on the way, you know. But so we didn't we didn't need to communicate with the actors at that moment directly, but it helped us. It absolutely helped us write the material knowing them and knowing their voices and knowing, knowing them as people as well as actors. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it, it was, I'm curious a bit in like, as Mr. Haddock, you brought up the uh, uh, difficulty that as Canadian, uh, just kind of with development of the ideas. There's not enough, you know, just to, just to jump, we just don't get enough opportunities and there's not enough math, there's not enough volume of uh, uh, of uh, of Canadian television accessible to Canadians, people you know, so uh, not to bitch about it, but it's something I've been bitching about for since thir for thirty years, and um, it it as a, it it's a, it has appears that we're coming towards a, a bit of an end game, not to throw any more alarmist uh, th things that people we're going to have to fight and be vocal, everybody, not not just in the guild, and so to to uh, demand. The um, y you know access to the uh, broadcasters that we support, well, not just the CBC, but the uh, the other you know Rogers and Bell have their you know obligations that they try to slide on constantly, and now we're at the point where it's um, you know where they're they're asking for more subsidies and you know we have to sort of fight back there, and you have to make that a, a vocal. I think that's uh, all we have time for. Um, I think Warren will say something, but I just want to finish by saying, obviously, there, there's this widespread reputation that showrunners are unyielding, uncompromising jerks. Uh, and and True. despite, <laughs> maybe elsewhere, but it, it's been a pleasure speaking with uh, both of you today. So thank you very much, thank you, Chris and Eric. Thank, thank you, you Eric. Thank you very much. Um, and um, just to uh, go off of what Chris is saying, it's not just a little bit of pushback from the broadcasters in Canada. Uh, the CRTC just took out over $200 million of original Canadian content programming uh, money earmarked to create shows that many of you guys in the audience and you know the esteemed guests here have been associated with. So there's a petition that the, the Directors Guild has. It, uh, check it on our, I think it's on our Twitter or uh, Facebook. Please sign the petition and then get 10 of your friends to sign it. If you're a director in the room, you got an email personally from me to implore you to get behind this uh, because we're sending it to the House of Commons to get revoked. And it's a very important thing. CRTC petition yes. In Twitter, on 
the CMPA, uh, Writers Guild, ACTRA, all of us, it's all on our socials. A question about it? Absolutely. All the guilds are behind it. So I don't want to hijack this amazing day with some uh, political stuff, but we are filmmakers, we're storytellers. To make sure you guys can tell your stories, please uh, help ensure that we can protect it. There is going to be a wonderful uh, reception in the atrium. Please join us. One more hand uh, of applause to our wonderful, esteemed guests and Kevin Eastwood for moderating his movie this Tuesday, 8.30, here at BIF. Thank you so much on behalf of the Directors Guild.